going to be your guide this afternoon. We're going to do an activity that is one that I've found really works well with students when you're trying to show a couple of things. It's going to include biology, climate, and geology. But the big idea, one of the ideas, is that not only do these processes work together, scientists in these areas need to work together. So interdisciplinary science, scientists are beginning to recognize that they can't just be a biologist, or they can't just be a geologist. They have to work with scientists of other disciplines. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Just want to tell you just a tiny bit about myself so you know where I'm coming from. I was a classroom teacher for 34 years. I'm old. <laughs> I retired. And the day I retired, I flew to Nebraska. I used to live outside of Chicago. And I flew to Nebraska, signed a contract for being the coordinator of education outreach for Andrill. Andrill is Antarctic Geological Drilling. And so went almost immediately back to Antarctica for a second time as the coordinator for Andrew. And worked for them for seven years, I think it was. Retired, <laughs> moved to Florida with my husband and our dogs, and I've been fishing every day, and swimming, and boating, and it's awesome. And a little worried about sea level rise, because we live right at sea level, and missed my buddies in polar education and had the opportunity to go to work for the U.S. Ice Drilling Program Office at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. So I'm their Director of Education and Outreach. Started out at half time and got increased to 75% time, which I was a little iffy about because I was ready to fish and do all those things. So I agreed to do it for 75% time, and so I'm back to work for my third work. <laughs> so it's fun, but it's been, I was involved with IPY, Dave Carlson and Jenny, and we, we were on the Education Outreach Committee for the international program. Elena was on that committee, and um, I'm trying to think who else was, oh, Sa Sa Sandra Zickas was on it too, Sandra Zickas. So um, anyway, there's a lot of us have, been working together for a long, long time. I'm so excited to have new faces this year, so glad you're here. This is a really, like I said, a neat activity to show interdisciplinary science and also a really um, interesting story. I love to have a story that goes with the science activity. So this one, the story is activi it's an activity that's modeled on research by Jan Strugno. And you heard her name mentioned this morning by Jenny. She's the one that came up with the idea of the Wikipedia, Wikibob, for women in science. So she's an Australian scientist, and this is about a cold water octopus that lives near Australia. And he's really cute. Look at him. That's a real picture. That's not a cartoon. Isn't he cute? I just think that is the coolest thing. So these guys are called, I'm, I wish, I wish Jose was in here so he could tell me for sure, but I think it's Megalodon. Well, I could be totally wrong. Cetibus. And it is a shallow water species of octopus found all around the Antarctic and only in the Southern Ocean. It's a close relative of the deep sea species, though. This picture is a juvenile. Adults can reach nearly one meter. Ask Jose, though. On his most recent expedition, mm -hmm. they found one that was 1.2 meters. Huge. They think it's the biggest one ever seen or ever found. So you can ask him about that. So you can find this activity where I used to work, andrill.org slash education. And all the directions and the cards that you're going to be using are there. And I'll give you that address later, too. So here's your directions. You're going to use the things that are in front of you, and your first one is the timeline. So you're going to use the colored paper strip, and you're going to do this with it. You're going to mark zero for present on the far right-hand side of the strip. Now, some of you are going to be upside down to the strip, but we're going to have time start from present and go back in time, so kind of thinking right to left. 
so old here and present here. But some of you are going to be on the other side of the table, so you'll have to think back. You'll be on some of those scientist timelines when they switch them around, they get totally confused. Right. Um, 100 million years ago, we'll be on the left side. So you guys decide which is right, which is left. Then you're going to just approximate, mark equal, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, between 0 and 10. And just approximate, hi, come in. See, anybody? You might, when you do this with your students, you might want to make this a meter long strip. Um, you can still get adding machine tape at, which I don't know what they use adding machines for anymore, but you can buy it in office stores and roll it out or a piece of paper, a meter long, and then just mark it off meter strips. So go ahead and do that now. And you're going to get out the little packet of just the map cards right now. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's maps on them, and they're, they're geologic maps. They've got the time at the bottom. Now, let me tell you what I would do as students. We're not going to take the time to do it today because I think you can do this activity without it. But on your table, could I borrow? I'm sorry, you're using that to. I'm sorry, you were using that to. No, I'm fine. And I'm ripping it out of your hand. <laughs> on your table, this isn't what I wanted. I ripped out your hand. Well, you. <laughs> What, what these maps are for is to have your students focus on how the world's continents moved and changed. So what the, in the activity book, there's actually a color card, and it might be in. No, I think we took it out because we're not going to use it. There's a color card that goes with it, and it says color all of North America, and it's on all the maps, this color. Color all of South America, find Australia, color this color. So the kids could work in a team and color those maps using that color code. Then when they lay the maps down, they see where Antarctica was, where Africa moved from here to here to here to here. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good thing to do with your students. I think you can see it without color, so I'm not gonna make you yeah. Okay. All right, so here's what you are gonna do though. You're gonna take these map cards, you're gonna place the map cards on the appropriate position on your timeline. Some may not be on your paper timeline. If not, kind of figure approximately on the table where they might be. Don't put them on the floor. Just, you know, some of them aren't going to be on there because the timeline just isn't long enough. Yep, I'm good. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to talk about the cards, and here's your questions as a group. What changes occur between the first card and the last card? Which continents moved closer to the poles? Mm -hmm. And which continents moved to latitudes closer to the equator? Mm -hmm. So those are the, just the general questions. Just kind of talk about them once you get them laid out by time. Mm -hmm. And all of these questions are in that activity, and all of the materials are in the activity online. So it's real, real simple to use. India moved to the equator. Yeah. Africa moved to the equator too. Well. Yes. yes. So Antarctica and North America to the pole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's still in the same place. <laughs> Look. Oh, yeah. Didn't move to the pole. But yeah, to the pole. You're the geologist. You have the information of the continental drift, plates moving. So what are some things as geologists that you have found? What changes occur between the first and the last cars? There's some big ideas. Somebody share out with the whole group? John? It sort of breaks up and separates. OK, so you kind of had this big puzzle put together, and it kind of broke apart into puzzle pieces. OK? Wagner would have been. Separated out. Anything else? Some of the, the lands went to the pole, to the okay. poles, and some OK, so she said some of the <laughs> continents moved toward the equator, some moved toward the poles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of heard a lot of the same kinds of things from the tables. And then, um, well, you, we could go through and name those continents, but I think you know which ones they are, so we won't do that. So we're going to switch our hats now. We're not geologists. We're going to become 
climatologist. Oh. So get the climate cards. Don't go to the biology cards yet, just climate cards. These cards represent information and evidence that climatologists have been gathering, and they represent how the climate of Antarctica changed over geologic time. So here's what you're going to do with them. You're going to look at those cards and answer this question. How has the average temperature changed over time? See what your group comes up with. How has the average temperature changed over time? 35 million. This is all the average. Just in general, what's happened to the temperature over time, according to this information? It became cooler. It became cooler. It became cooler. All right, so it, cool, it was, became cooler from 65 million years ago, right? We had a question here, though, and he's going, well, how Antarctica at 60 million years ago, I think, on your map was yes. at the bottom yeah. of the world. So how's that? But hold that thought, because we have a few more things we're going to do, and we'll see where that, where that goes. We also were talking about, um, and just remember that in my head. We'll come back. I the just world lost mean, what I was about to say. Oh, the world, yeah, the mean temperature. He was asking, is it the average temperature of Antarctica, which is what the activity says, or was it the world, or did it matter? Let's come yes. back to that, because yeah. I don't have an answer for that. It's supposedly Antarctica, but we may, there may be a mistake in the activity. Although scientists read it and told us it was right. <laughs> <laughs> they put people down. Yeah. So place, this, place these now in the order of their dates. You might have already done it um, on your timeline. <laughs> And it looks like a lot of you, as you were putting, you put them on the timeline anyway, and so you may have already answered this question. What changes occurred in the global position of Antarctica between the first and the last? So did you talk about that? You know, this is the one. Well, and then the other one. Yeah. 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 So yes. you're so we're, now you're going to look, the climate scientists have had their information, the geologists have their information, now comes Jan Strugnell studying these little cute octopuses. Octopuses is correct, I always thought I'm not. And she goes, no, it's octopuses. Okay, I'll go for that. So a uh, big question here is what role did ocean currents play in the change in climate? That's a biggie that goes with this, so we're going to be talking about them throughout this because where do the octopuses live? They're in the ocean. So what did those currents do? So here's a little octopus background. Um, marine animals depend on dissolved oxygen in the ocean. And cold water holds more oxygen than warm, so it can support more organisms. Pretty much what Dave Carlson was saying this morning, that those very cold waters have the most nutrients. And Many species of octopuses, I love this part, they sport ink as a defense, but the octopuses that live really deep where there's no light, it's a real high metabolic activity. So they don't have ink sacs, or they have ink, small ink sacs with no ink, because they don't need them. If they squirt ink, it's black down there anyway, so it doesn't help them get rid. So it's not a good, not a good defense mechanism for really deep water octopuses. So, Get your biology cards. And here's what you're going to do with them. Okay, so you're going to place these cards in order. So in other words, we probably have a science, big science symposium of all these geologists, climate, climate change, or climate scientists, and biologists together. And now we're putting in their information. So put them on the two lines. What changes in diversity and location of octopuses occurred between the first card and the last? And I believe there's one more. Yes. What could have happened? First of all, where do you see three cards stacked up? You have one of each card. Where is that? You have a map, you have a climate card, you have a biology card all at the same time. What is that? What time? 35. 35 million years ago. So take a look at those, that too. What could have happened between 35 million years and 15 to 20 year, million years ago so that the Pacific octopus species was able to move to the Atlantic Ocean? How did that happen? What happened? What was important at that time? Further back. New lineages 
of octopus migrate to deeper habitats. Why might they do that? What do we know about an octopus? What is it? And I think earlier, where, where were they living before? Shallow. Shallow, why? Because that's where, the, that's where That's where they were right. finding the nutrients in the oxygen, oh, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And so then when, when there's more nutrients down mm -hmm. and oxygen too, then they go. Deeper. And what made it have more nutrients and more oxygen? Uh, the, the flow change. Okay, and what could have caused well, see, the change? I'm thinking, that's why I'm looking at the right, as soon as that 60, opens up. That's 60, so what's at 35? Yeah, it opens up. The water, yeah. You've got that gap. And gates open. That's oh, the name. Oh, and gates. and gates. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened when that happened? When, when yeah. You just get right. in ocean, ocean, circulation, ocean circulation, which is bringing nutrients and things to the deeper waters. Well, and and when you get that sudden so ocean current, that circumpolar current, what did Dave say this morning? That circumpolar the, current. Yeah, the, the deep. When you're getting up well, and you And you're also getting the very, very salty, cold, cold water under the sea ice that's sinking and that's that's and it just kind of keeps going and the circumpolar up to where he said 30 degrees 30 degrees that, that's that's pretty much I guess I'm keeping it there I mean we do have the deep water going up to the equator but you've got this circumpolar just going around and around and around. it's in the, in the polar region yeah, my question right. is how much sea ice is really here at this time frame because it says that we you know Antarctica is cool no plants no longer surviving vegetation is it but <laughs> All right, so there were shallow water octopuses around Antarctica. Why in the shallow waters? Okay, they needed oxygen, they needed nutrients, and at that point in time, they they had ink sacs or didn't have ink sacs 50 million years ago. What? They had insects or didn't have them. Did. It says they did. They did have they insects did. because <laughs> why? Yeah. Why there would they have insects? Yes. Because they were competing in shallow yes. water. Yes. But then, yes. see yes. what Dave yes. said this morning. <laughs> he said when the the circumpolar current when it started around Antarctica and got Antarctica to be very cold. When did that happen, according to our cards? Okay, and what happened geologically that allowed that circumpolar current to start up? What was it that happened then? Okay, so you had a, this activity is called plates and gates. So think about there was a gate that opened. It was a really, really important gate for Antarctica. Where was it? Yeah, the Drake's Passage. So if you look at that map, you've got the Drake's Passage now open, and Dave said, you know, that the circumpolar current went up, I think he said 30 degrees north, right? Between 30 and 30. 30 degrees south. Okay, so 30 degrees south. Yeah, I'm sorry. 30 degrees south. So this circumpolar current then is keeping Antarctica cold. Antarctica gets icy, it stays cold, and it just keeps going around Antarctica. And then we also had all the stuff Dave was talking about this morning with that sea ice causing really cold, salty water underneath it because it left all the salt there, and salt water is very dense. So phew, there goes the deep water currents heading north and heading around Antarctica, and then some of them go on up and up well. Well, Jan Strugnell was studying these octopuses, and with DNA, they were able to find species of these shallow water Antarctic octopuses. All of a sudden, after this period of time, were found where the water upwells in the warmer waters, and she's going, how can that be? Where did these guys come from? How did that happen? And by working with 
the geologist and the climatologist, they were able to put together the story of how these octopuses were from the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the Antarctic, and how they had cousins in these different places. And based on that climate information, the plates and gates, and then the DNA of these octopuses. <laughs> uh, an interesting activity, I think. I, I like this one mm -hmm. just because you can get into some issues about Antarctica, about circumpolar um, circulation, about the paling, and all kinds of stuff. So, and the interrelations. Well, the interdisciplinary and the science that he's in. Any questions about this or any questions you had about the information? Yeah. Not that I can answer it. No. <laughs> Do we know if the, then the closing between the Americas had I, any effect? That's a really good question, and your, their table had that too. Um, <laughs> for first. Oh. They were yeah. first. <laughs> no, we weren't so good after all. So that's because you're the queen. We should act like students, you know? <laughs> that's right. Oh well, we try. And that's very easy. <laughs> and and I, I don't have an answer for that, but that is one that I think would be a good one to ask. Geologists. Well, they probably have it. Well, they probably do. <laughs> you have probably. Or maybe you. Yeah. I guess from fossils, but I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Or it's okay. The Gulf Stream has the possibility to develop after the closing. Well, that, yeah. That's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's well, the Gulf Stream and, and the yeah. Gulf Stream. Because right. then it can no longer flow through there, so then the Gulf Stream can go more. So that would have affected that. I'm not sure if it would have any effect on our octopuses. Yeah. <laughs> so. Never know. So, so the, the octopus was found in the northern Atlantic, so we need to go straight to bring it. Yeah. 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 So I'd like to ask you to put the cards back, and I probably yeah. stole yeah. somebody's. Yeah. 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 So just the last, the last slide that I have about this activity is these cards tell the story of how the deep sea species of octopuses grew in diversity in the southern ocean and extended their habitat range deeper and deeper as the oceans grew colder. Of course, then that was when they also lost the, their ink sacs and lost their ink because they didn't need them anymore. And then by putting down the climate cards and the biology cards, and if you had them make had your students use the information to make a, a, the whole you know, epics and all of that if you're doing geologic time, that information is in there too. And then they lay out the maps and you end up finding, like you did, the three of the cards are on the same um, time timeline there. So everything would be... Everything, yeah, let me, give, let me give you the uh, link just on the next slide, the link where you can get this activity. But you can learn more. Here's, I want these pictures. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. We can make a cartoon out of yes. this. I think they look like cartoons. But the, Jan Strangel is the lead author on this paper, and if you want more information, this is the paper that you can read from. Read it from. Okay. So then the big ideas from this, I think we've already touched, but the, the events are scattered along the timeline, except for one card in each group around 35 million years. And this is again kind of drawn together in the activity itself. Yeah. These events are related and driven by the opening of the Drake Passage. Plate tectonics, although slow, have a large effect on climate change and in this case triggered the isolation of Antarctica from warm northern waters. Cold water can hold more oxygen, so the deeper water can then sustain life. The octopuses, which before could only survive on the shallow ocean itself, began to diversify and invade the deeper waters. The cooling of the oceans, Antarctica's climate cooled, which triggered the growth of the ice sheets. When the Great Passage opened, the ocean currents were no longer restricted by the presence of South America and began to circle Antarctica, creating the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The waters around Antarctica became very cold. This resulted in isolation and cooling of Antarctica, and the ice sheets began to cool. Okay? So this act, whoops. Okay, and the next slide, ah, uh, let me get rid of this. The next slide is a different activity. I don't want to put it out there anymore. I just want to write that picture. Just switching gears a little faster than I wanted to, but I've got two other activities I'm just going to tell you about that I think are excellent for a couple of different ideas. This is one we've done in this workshop before. I didn't want to do it again because many of you are returning. But I have to tell you, I think this is one of the most important activities you can do. Um, 
when we first started an IPY, our goal was to get people to know that polar bears can't roast penguins on spits. <laughs> they, just, they can't eat them, they can't do anything with them unless they get on an airplane and fly there. So um, we said if we could just get people to know that polar bears and penguins don't live in the same place, we will have won this game. We set our bar pretty low. Um, but this year in America, we had an insurance commercial where the father was going to his fourth grade son, son, we're going on vacation, we're going to Alaska, and we're gonna see polar bears and penguins. Oh, no. And the son looked at his father and said, Dad, polar bears and penguins don't live in the same place. And we went, wow. yes, yeah, they did it. <laughs> they did it, we can stop worrying about it. They know that. So, so I moved on to this one. <laughs> this is a huge misconception. Everybody is hearing about the Arctic sea ice is melting. Oh my gosh, people in Florida going, oh my gosh, the Arctic sea ice is melting. We're going to be flooded. Oh no, should we sell our houses? Okay. Major misconception. So, what we, it's a very simple activity. Usually at the beginning of a workshop, I have people set up these pans of rocks on one side water in the other, mark land ice, sea ice, or floating ice, land-based ice. And we talk about what that means, you know, land-based ice or glaciers and ice sheets and ice caps and things like that. Floating ice, icebergs, ice shelves that are actually still attached to land, but they're floating. And those are the ones that Dave was talking about this morning that are scaring us a little bit. Even if they melt and break off, it's, it's not going to raise sea level. But what happens is they are acting like buttresses holding land ice on land. So when those break off, land ice can slide pretty fast into the water. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about the ice core drilling, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and why that's a concern. But this shows why it's a concern. They put ice on the rocks in one pan, ice in the water in the other, now we let it melt during the workshop or during the beginning of class to end of class. And then come back, they've marked a line on the water when they put the ice in. Well, at the end of class, the floating ice has not raised sea level when it's melted. The land ice has, and it's real obvious about that. Then you can go on and talk about what that means. So it's a really good one. I like this activity, it's very simple. The directions are also the same place as plates and gates, so if you want to write that down, it's www.andril.org, it's A-N-D-R-I-L-L.org slash education. There are two books on the website. One of them is called Antarctica's Climate Secrets, and those of you that are Italian, it's a translated into Italian. Matteo has that translation and hopefully he has it digitized that he can share it with you. It's, unfortunately, the Italian book is not on the website. But he has all the activities in that. The, the Plates and Gates is not in Antarctica's Climate Secrets, though. It's in the book that's called The Elf, or the Environmental Literacy Framework, E-L-F. So there's two books. The one with the color on the, on the cover is the one that has plates and gates and this activity. Very simple activity. If you're a scientist, I would recommend doing this in the beginning of every talk. When I go out and do community talks, I do this in every talk, because I think it's really important. Um, and just one other one I want to share with you. Um, they've talked about how important the oceans are. We've talked about how the oceans are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now the southern oceans are doing a big load of that job, but all the oceans are doing that. So our oceans are becoming acidic because carbon dioxide in the water makes water the pH drop. So life in an acid bath, if you can get a shell, if you don't live near a beach, if you can go to a raw bar where they, <laughs> they serve plants, you can get shells from them. Um, Come visit me in Florida and I'll give you all the shells you want. <laughs> so you take just a shell from the beach, cover it in, that's painter's tape. We call it painter's tape where you tape it and then paint up to the tape. Um, or masking tape would work. Cover it completely, top and bottom. 
And then you can carve out, or if you have some younger kids, cut out areas with scissors and glue it so your initials show, or a penguin, or something fun. Then you put the shell in vinegar. Mm -hmm. Try it first, because different vinegars have different uh, strengths. They have strength. different strengths. Yes, they do. And, and, and I put on what I thought was a real strong shell in one and left it overnight and then it eaten completely through the shell. So be careful of the shell. <laughs> Test it first on the, the type of shell you have and the type of vinegar. Vinegar is more acidic than the ocean, but it works fast and it makes, it makes the point. So what happens in the more acidic ocean, it's, it's dissolving the, um, any shells or corals or anything like that that, you, that are um, calcium, and they're having lots of trouble. So we're worried about our fisheries and our oceans because the basis of the food chain is being attacked by the acid in the ocean. And that's a real scary thing. Um, Australia is seeing it on their Great Barrier Reef. We see it in Florida on all of our reefs are, are bleaching, is what it's called. They're turning white, they're dying. We have an experience uh, on the pH value. Let's say we use pH 4 or 3 or the best? It's not, uh, it's not a huge difference, and I, I don't know. Does anybody in here know what the pH of the ocean is right now? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it turns from 8 pH because it's basic and to 7. So it's, it's one. Uh, I think it's it's very slight. Yeah. It's very slight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to it's it's a test. Yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah. Um, and of course, vinegar is much more. Yeah. Well, it's much better. So, but that's that's a nice one. It's kind of an art activity that that um, art and science that you can do that they can do something. But then it can be used as a step on stepping off point then to talk about one of the results of climate change. So, any questions? How long it takes to have It depends on the shell and it depends on the, the vinegar you use. Um, I had the catch really nicely into one in a couple of hours, but when I did it before, it was overnight. Um, in our, my class, we did it overnight, even the next day, washed it really real nice, but they were more like a clam shell, a thicker shell. Um, I was going to bring you all shells. <laughs> I was overweighting my bag. I can't believe them at home. I did bring you a shark's tooth, though. <laughs> so we, our, our beach where we live had paleo sharks out in the ocean. We have paleo sand beds in the Gulf of Mexico. And they just wash up on our beaches for about a two-mile stretch. And every time we go, we pick So I brought you all a shark's tooth that I think from passing out at snap talks. And the kind of snap talks all have that you can take a shark's tooth. Mateo, who's a marine biologist, says, shark's teeth? Where do you get shark's teeth? <laughs> On the beach every night, what do you mean? He goes, oh, I've never seen one. I go, what? I, I had no idea it was such a, it's so easy where we live. We're just in the right place. But a shark loses 24,000 teeth in its lifetime. So we have lots, 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 lots of teeth. teeth. We must have had a lot of sharks, too. So. So that's all I have for you. You're, what you're going to be doing, we're a little early. Um, 